Brussels, Belgium. It's got to happen soon, Comair Sant observed. Shit, they got their troops as ready as I've ever seen. They can't wait until all our reforger units are fully in place. They have to hit us soon. I know what you're saying, Charlie, but we can't move first. Any word on our visitors? The Air Force General referred to Major Chernyavin's team of Spetsnaz commandos. Still sitting tight. A unit of the elite GSG-9 German border guards had the safe house under continuous surveillance, with a second English ambush team between them and their supposed target in Lammersdorf. Intelligence officers from most of the NATO countries were part of the surveillance team, each with a direct line to his government. What if they're bait, trying to get us to strike first? I know we can't do that, General. What I want is a green light to initiate Copy. Dreamland when we know it's all for real. We have to get our licks in fast, boss. Sanctuary back. Trapped by his duties in his underground command post, he hadn't been to his official residence in ten days. He wondered if any general officer in the whole world had gotten any sleep in the past two weeks. If you put the orders up, how fast can you react? I have all the birds loaded and ready now. My crews are briefed. If I order them to stand too, I can have Dreamland running 30 minutes from your signal. Okay, Charlie. The President has given me authority to react to any attack. Tell your people to stand too. Right. Sakir's phone rang. He lifted it, listened briefly, and looked up. Our visitors are moving, he told Comair Sent to his operations officer. The code word is firelight. NATO forces would now go to maximum alert. Aachen, Federal Republic of Germany. The Spetsnaz team left the safe house in two small vans and drove south on the road to Lammersdorf. With their leader killed in a traffic accident, the second in command, a captain, had been delivered copies of the papers his boss had died to get and fully briefed his men. They were quiet and tense. The officer had taken pains to explain to his men that their escape had been carefully planned. That once clear of the target, they'd get to another safe house and wait for their Red Army comrades to arrive in five days. They were the cream of the Red Army, he told them, thoroughly trained to carry out dangerous missions behind enemy lines, hence valuable to the state. Every man had combat experience fighting in the mountains of Afghanistan, he reminded them. They were trained. They were ready. The men accepted this speech, as elite troopers usually did, in total silence. Chosen most of all for their intelligence, each of them knew that the speech was merely that. The mission depended largely on luck, and their luck had already gone bad. Every one of them wished that Major Chernyavin were there, and wondered if somehow the mission might have been blown. One by one, they set these thoughts aside. Soon every man was reviewing his part in the mission to destroy Lammersdorf. The drivers were KGB agents well experienced at working in foreign lands, and wondering exactly the same thing. Both vehicles stayed together, driving conservatively, wary of vehicles that followed them. Each had a scanner radio tuned to the local police frequencies, and another for communicating with each other. The KGB officers had discussed the mission an hour before. Moscow Center had told them that NATO was not yet fully alerted. The lead driver, whose regular cover job was driving a taxi, wondered if a full NATO alert meant a parade through Red Square. Turning right now. Car 3, close in. Car 1, turn left at the next intersection and get ahead of them. Colonel Weber spoke over a tactical radio of the sort used by FIST, fire support team, units. The ambush had been ready for several days now, and as soon as their targets had emerged from their safe house, the word had been flashed all over the Federal Republic. NATO establishments already on alert were brought to full battle readiness. This could only be the opening move in a shooting war. Unless, Weber admitted to himself, they were simply moving from one secure place to wait further in another one. He didn't know which way things would turn, though surely it had to begin soon. Didn't it? The two trucks were now in a rural part of western Germany, driving southeast through the German-Belgian nature park a scenic route often traveled by tourists and sightseers. They had chosen this side road to avoid the military traffic on the major highways, but as they passed through Murlarchuta, the lead driver frowned as he saw a military convoy of tanks on low-hauler trailers. Strangely, the tanks were loaded backwards, with their massive guns facing aft. British tanks, he saw, 
new challengers. Well, he hadn't expected to see any German Leopard tanks on the Belgian border. There had never been any possibility of preventing a German mobilization, and he tried to convince himself that the rest of the NATO countries had not moved as quickly as they could have. Ah, if this mission were successful, then NATO's communications would be seriously damaged, and maybe the armored spearheads would indeed come to rescue them. The convoy slowed. The driver considered pulling around them, but his orders were to be inconspicuous. Everyone ready? Weber asked from his chase car. Ready. Bloody complex off this, Colonel Armstrong thought. Tankers, SAS, and the Germans all working together. But worth it to bag a bunch of Spetsnaz. The convoy slowed and stopped at a picnicking area. Weber halted his car a hundred meters away. It was now in the hands of the English ambush team. Flares erupted around the two small vans. The KGB driver cringed at being in the center of so much light. Then he looked forward to see the barrel of the tank just 50 meters ahead of him rise from its travel rest and center on his windshield. Attention, a voice called in Russian over a megaphone. Spetsnaz soldiers, attention. You are surrounded by a company of mechanized troops. Come out of your vehicles singly and unarmed. If you open fire, you will be killed within seconds. The second voice began speaking. Come out, comrades. This is Major Chernyavin. There is no chance. The commandos exchanged looks of horror. In the lead vehicle, the captain started to pull the pin on a grenade. A sergeant leaped on him and wrapped his hand around the captain's. We cannot be taken alive. Those are our orders, the captain shouted. The devil's mother we can't, the sergeant screamed. One at a time, comrades. Out with hands high, and be careful. The private emerged from the back door of the van, one slow foot at a time. Come to the sound of my voice, Ivanov, Chernyavin said from a wheelchair. The Major had told much to earn the chance to save his detachment. He had worked with these men for two years, and he could not let them be slaughtered to no purpose. It was one thing to be loyal to the state, another to be loyal to the men he'd led in combat operations. You will not be hurt. If you have any weapons, drop them now. I know about the knife you carry, Private Ivanov. Very good. Next man. It went quickly. A joint team of Special Air Service and GSG-9 commandos collected their Soviet counterparts, handcuffed them, and led them off to be blindfolded. Soon only two were left. The grenade made it tricky. By this time the captain had seen the futility of his action, but it proved impossible to locate the pin for the grenade. The sergeant shouted a warning to Chernyavin, who wanted to come forward himself, but couldn't. The captain came out last. He wanted to throw the grenade at the officer who, he thought, had betrayed his country, only to see a man whose legs were swathed in plastic. Chernyavin could see the look on the man's face. Andrei Ilyich, would you prefer that your life should end for nothing? The Major asked. The bastards drugged me and learned enough to kill you all. I could not let them do this. I have a live grenade, the captain said loudly. I will throw it into the truck. This he did before anyone could shout to stop. A moment later, the truck exploded, destroying the group's maps and plans for escape. For the first time in a week, Chernyavin's face broke into a wide grin. Well done, Andrushka. Two other Spetsnaz groups were less lucky and were intercepted within sight of their targets by German units privy to Chernyavin's capture. But 20 additional groups were in the Federal Republic and not every NATO site had gotten the word in time. A score of vicious firefights erupted on both sides of the Rhine. A war to involve millions began with squad and platoon-sized units fighting desperate actions in the dark. Chapter 17, The Frisbees of Greenland. Germany, forward edge of the battle area. The view would have been frightening to most men. There were solid clouds overhead at 4,000 feet. He flew through showers that he more heard than saw on this black night, and the dark outlines of trees appeared to reach up and snatch at his speeding flight. Only a madman would be so low on such a night. 
so much the better. He smiled inside his... Engine right. Hands. Engine right. Colonel Douglas Ellington's fingertips caressed the control stick of his F-19A Ghost Rider attack fighter. While his other hand rested on the side-by-side -side throttle control on the left side cockpit wall. The head-up display projected on the windshield in front of him reported 625 knots indicated airspeed, 106 feet of altitude, a heading of 013, and around the numbers was a monocular holographic image of the terrain before. The image came from a forward-looking infrared camera Engine left. nose, augmented by an invisible laser that interrogated the ground eight times per second. For peripheral vision, his oversized helmet was fitted with low-light goggles. Raising hell over our heads, his backseater reported. Major Don Isley monitored the radio and radar signals, as well as their own instruments. All systems continue nominal, range to target now 90 miles. Right, the Duke responded. It had been an automatic nickname for Ellington, who even looked vaguely like the jazz musician. Ellington relished the mission. They were skimming north at perilously low level over the angular terrain of East Germany, and their frisbee, never more than 200 feet off the ground, jerked up and down to the pilot's constant course adjustments. Lockheed called her the Ghost Rider. The pilots called her the frisbee, the F-19A, the secretly developed stealth attack fighter. She had no corners, no box shapes to allow radar signals to bounce cleanly off her. Her high bypass turbofans were designed to emit a blurry infrared signature at most. From above, her wings appeared to mimic the shape of a cathedral bell. From in front, they curved oddly toward the ground, earning her the affectionate nickname of Frisbee. Though she was a masterpiece of electronic technology inside, she usually didn't use her active systems. Radars and radios made electronic noise that an enemy might detect. And the whole idea of the Frisbee was that she didn't seem to exist at all. Far over their heads on both sides of the border, hundreds of fighter aircraft played a deadly game of bluff, racing toward the border and then turning away both sides trying to goad the other into committing to battle. Each side had airborne radar aircraft with which to control such a battle, and so gain the advantage in a war which, though few yet knew it, had already begun. And we're getting a quick one in, Ellington thought. We're finally doing something smart. He'd had a hundred missions over Vietnam in the first production F-111A fighters. The Duke was the Air Force's leading expert on covert low-level missions, and it was said that he could bull die a chuck hole in the Kansas tornado at midnight. That wasn't quite true. The Frisbee could never handle a tornado. The sad truth was that the F-19 handled like a pig, a consequence of her ungainly design. But Ellington didn't care. Being invisible was better than being agile, he judged knowing that he was about to prove or disprove that proposition. The Frisbee Squadron was now penetrating the most concentrated SAM belt the world had ever known. Range to primary target is now 60 miles, Isley advised. All onboard systems continue nominal. No radars are locked onto us. Looking good, Duke. Roger. Ellington pushed the stick forward and dived as they passed over the crest of a small hill, then bottomed out at 80 feet over a wheat field. The Duke was playing his game to the limit, drawing on years of experience in low-level attacks. Their primary target was a Soviet IL-76 mainstay, an AWACS-type aircraft that was circling near Magdeburg, agreeably within 10 miles of their secondary target, the E-8 highway bridges over the Elbe at Hohenroarten. The mission was getting a lot hairier. The closer they got to the mainstay, the more radar signal hit their aircraft, its intensity growing at a square function. Sooner or later, enough signal would be reflected back to the mainstay to be detectable, even by curved wings made of radar transparent composites. All the stealth technology did was to make radar detection harder, 
not impossible. Would they be seen by the mainstay? If so, when? And how quickly would the Russians react? Keep her on the deck, he told himself. Play the game by the rules you've practiced out. They had rehearsed this mission for nine days in Dreamland, the top secret exercise area in the sprawl of Nellis Air Force Base, Nevada. Even the E-3A sentry could barely make them out at 40 miles. And the sentry was a far better radar platform than the mainstay, wasn't it? That's what you're here to find out, boy. There were five mainstays on duty, all a hundred clicks east of the inter-German border. A nice, safe distance, what with over 300 fighters between them and the border. 20 miles, Duke. Right. Call it off, Don. Raj, still no fire control emanations on us, and no search stuff is lingering our way. Lots of radio chatter, but mostly west of us. Very little box coming from the target. Nellington reached his left hand down to arm the four AIM 9M Sidewinder missiles hanging under his wings. The weapon indicator light blinked a lethal, friendly green. Eighteen miles, the target appears to be circling normally, not taking evasive action. Ten miles to the minute, Ellington computed in his mind. One minute, forty seconds. Sixteen miles. Nisley read the numbers off a computer readout key to the Navstar satellite navigation system. The mainstay would not have a chance. The Frisbee would not begin to climb until she was directly underneath the target. Fourteen miles. Twelve. Ten. Eight. Six miles to the converted air transport. The mainstay just reversed her turn. Yeah, she's jinking. A foxfire just swept over us, Isley said evenly. A MiG-25 interceptor, presumably acting on instructions from the IL-76, was now searching for them. With its high power and small arc, the Foxfire stood a good chance of acquiring them, stealth technology or not. The mainstay might have it. Anything locked on it? Not yet. Isley's eyes were glued to the threat receiver instrument. No missile control Zero radar one five. had centered on Hornet the one two point two. Coming under the target. Right. Climbing now. Ellington eased back on his stick and punched up full afterburners. The Frisbee's engines could only give him Mach 1.3, but this was the place to use all the power he had. According to the weather people, these clouds topped out at 20,000 feet, and the IL-76 would be about 5,000 above that. Now the Frisbee was vulnerable. No longer lost in the ground clutter, her engines radiating their maximum signature, the stealth aircraft was broadcasting her presence. I'm faster, baby. Dally ho Ellington said too loudly over the intercom as he burst through the clouds, and the night vision systems instantly showed him the mainstay, five miles away and diving for cover in front of him. Too late. The head-on closing speed was nearly a thousand miles per hour. The colonel centered his gun sight pipper on the target. A warbling tone came into his headset. The sidewinder seekers had locked onto the target. His right thumb toggled the launch enable switch, and his forefinger squeezed the trigger twice. The sidewinders left the aircraft half a second apart. Their brilliant exhaust flames dazzled him, but he did not take his eyes off the missile as they raced for the target. It took eight seconds. He looked them all the way in. Both missiles angled for the mainstay's starboard wing. Thirty feet away, laser proximity fuses detonated, filling the air with lethal fragments. Aboard an E-3A sentry circling over Strasbourg, the radar technicians noted with satisfaction that all five Soviet radar craft had been killed within two minutes. It all worked. The F-19 really did surprise them. The Brigadier General in command of Operation Dreamland leaned forward in his command chair and toggled his microphone. Trumpeter, 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 he said, then switched off. Okay, boys, he breathed, make it count. 
Amid the clouds of NATO tactical fighters hovering near the border, a hundred low-level attack fighters broke clear and dove for the ground. Half were F-111 hardbarks. Altitude. The other half, GR-1 tornadoes, their wings heavy with fuel tanks and smart bombs. They followed the second wave of Frisbees, already 60 miles into East Germany, fanning out to their ground targets. Behind the strike aircraft, all-weather Eagle and Phantom interceptors, directed by the sentries circling over the Rhine, began to launch their radar-guided missiles at Soviet fighters that had just lost their airborne controllers. Finally, a third team of NATO aircraft swooped in low, seeking out the ground radar sites that were coming on to replace the radar coverage of the dead mainstays. Colt 1, passing waypoint 1 at 1,100. Chevy 1, passing waypoint 1 at 1,100. Amid the clouds of NATO tactical fighters hovering near the border, Chevy 1, passing waypoint 2 at 1,100. Half were F-111F hardbarks. The other half, GR-1 tornadoes, their wings heavy with fuel tanks and smart bombs. They followed the second wave of Frisbees, already 60 miles into East Germany, fanning out to their ground targets. Behind the strike aircraft, all-weather Eagle and Phantom interceptors, directed by the sentries circling over the Rhine, began to launch their radar-guided missiles at Soviet fighters that had just lost their airborne controllers. Finally, a third team of NATO aircraft swooped in low, seeking out the ground radar sites that were coming on to replace the radar coverage of the dead mainstays. Hohenroarte, German Democratic Republic. Ellington circled his target at a thousand feet, several miles away. It was a double bridge, a pair of concrete arches, each about 500 yards across, and with two traffic lanes that crossed the River Elba in the middle of a gentle S-curve. Pretty bridges. Ellington guessed that they dated back to the 30s, since this main road from Berlin to Braunschweig had been one of the first autobahns. Old Adolf himself might have driven across these bridges, Ellington reflected. So much the better. At the moment, a low-light television in his targeting systems showed them to be covered with Russian T-80 tanks all heading west. Ellington evaluated the picture on his television screen. Colt 1, passing this could only be the second echelon of the army deployed to attack NATO. There was an SA-6 battery atop Hill 76, south of the bridges on the east bank, sighted there to defend them. It had to be fully alert now. 
His earphones chirped constantly with noise from his threat receiver as the search radars from a score of air defense batteries swept continuously over his aircraft. If only one of them got a good return, pucker factor, Ellington reflected grimly. How's the pave tack? Nominal, Isley responded curtly. Pilot and backseater were both under enormous stress. Illuminate, Ellington ordered. In the back seat, Isley activated the pave tack target illumination laser. The elaborate pave tack gear was built into the Frisbee's drooping nose cone. Its lowermost part was a rotating turret containing a carbon dioxide laser and television camera. The Major used his joystick controls to center the TV picture on the bridge, then unmasked the infrared laser. An invisible dot appeared in the center of the North Span's bridge deck. A computer system would keep it there until told to do otherwise, and a videotape recorder would make a visual record of the raid's success or failure. Target is lit, I said. Still no fire control radars on it. Nemo, this is Shade 4. The target is lit. Rod. Fifteen seconds later, the first aardvark screamed south a bare 30 feet over the water, popped up, and loosed a single GBU-15 paveway laser-guided bomb before it turned hard to the east over Hohenrad. Engine right. An optical computer Engine system right. in the bomb's nose noted the reflected infrared beam, centered it, and adjusted the fins accordingly. South of the bridge, the SAM battery commander was trying to decide what the noise was. His search radar did not show the Frisbee. He had been told not to expect the presence of friendly aircraft. The safe travel lane was 15 miles to the north, over the frontal aviation base at Malmiko. Maybe that's where the noise was coming from, he thought. No special alarm has been sent out. The northern Northern horizon engaging bandit at all 074. Though he did not know it, four loose Vapa tornadoes had just made a single pass over Malminkel, leaving hundreds of explosive cluster munitions in their wake. Chevy 1, engaging a half bandit dozen at all 0534 and 4500. Sending a fireball of jet fuel that rose up into the rain-filled sky. The battery commander hesitated not at all. He shouted an order for his men to switch their fire control radars from standby to active and trace them around their bridge. Colt 1, engaging bandit a at moment later, 052 one detected an F-111 coming up with it. Oh, shit. The Colt 1, engaging bandit at all 053 for 1 at 8000. Another for good measure at the search radar. A second paveway at the bridge. Then the F-111 turned violently left. The missile launch officer blanched as he realized what had just appeared from nowhere onto his scope and salvoed his three missiles. The incoming aircraft had to be hostile had just separated three smaller objects. His first SAM struck and exploded on the high-tension power lines that spanned the river just south of the bridges. The entire valley was strobe-lighted as the power line fell sparking into the river. The other two SAMs raced past the surreal explosion and locked onto the second F-111. The first paveway impacted precisely in the center of the northern span. It was a delayed action bomb and penetrated into the thick concrete before exploding a few yards from a battalion commander's tank. The north span was strong. It had been in use for over 50 years. But the 945 pounds of high explosive ripped it apart. In an instant, the graceful concrete arch was cut in two, a ragged 20-foot gap appearing between the two unsecured flying buttresses. They were not designed to stand alone, particularly with armored vehicles rumbling over them. The bomb released by the second aardvark struck closer to shore, and the eastern side of the span failed entirely, taking eight tanks into the elbow with it. The second F-111 did not live to see this, however. One of the racing SA-6 missiles struck it broadside and blew it to pieces three seconds after the aircraft launched strikes obliterated the pair of Soviet radar vehicles. Neither side had time for grief. 
another f one eleven screamed up river as the surviving sam crews frantically searched for targets thirty seconds later the north span was totally destroyed brick sized chunks of ferro concrete scattered on the river bottom from three smart bomb impacts Nisley switched his laser designator to the south span. It was clogged with tanks, log jammed by a BMP-1 personnel carrier blown whole from one bridge span to the other by the first bomb, torn asunder and blazing on the west end of the bridge. The fourth aardvark lofted a pair of bombs which homed in remorselessly on the laser spot now stuck on the turret of a stopped tank. The sky was alight with blazing diesel fuel and streaked with hand-launched SAMs, that had been blind-fired by panicked riflemen. Both paveways exploded a scant ten feet apart, and the entire bridge span failed at once, dropping a company of armored vehicles into the Elf. One more thing to do, Ellington told himself. There. The Soviets had stockpiled bridging equipment on the secondary road paralleling the river. The engineers were probably nearby. The Frisbee screeched over the rows of trucks, each of which carried a section of ribbon bridge, and deployed a row of flares before skimming back west toward the Federal Republic of Germany and safety. The three surviving aardvarks came in one at a time, each dropping a pair of rock eye canisters into the truck park, ripping the bridging equipment to bits, and, their pilots fervently hoped, killing some of the skilled bridging engineers as well. Then the aardvarks turned west to follow the F-19 home. By this time, a second team of F-15 Eagle fighters had darted into East Germany to clear four lanes for the returning NATO strike aircraft. They fired their radar and infrared guided missiles at the mix, trying to vector toward the returning fighter bombers. But the American fighters still had their aerial radars to direct them, and the Soviets did not. The result reflected it. Soviet fighters had not had time to reorganize after the loss of the mainstays, and their formations were savage. Even worse, the SAM batteries that were supposed to support the MiGs were ordered to engage the invading aircraft, and the surface-to-air missiles began to pluck targets out of the sky entirely without discrimination as the NATO aircraft clung to the nap of the earth. By the time the last aircraft recrossed the border into West Germany, Operation Dreamland had lasted a total of 27 minutes. It had been a costly mission. Two of the priceless Frisbees and 11 strike aircraft had been lost. Yet, it had been a success. Over 200 Soviet all-weather fighters had been destroyed by the NATO fighters, and perhaps a hundred more by friendly SANS. The most elite squadrons of the Soviet Air Defense Force had been brutalized and, because of it, for the time being, NATO would own the night skies over Europe. Thirty-six major bridges had been targeted, thirty had been destroyed, and all of the rest damaged. The initial Soviet ground attack, scheduled to begin in two hours, would not be supported by the second echelon, nor by specialty units of mobile SAMs, engineers, and other crucial late arrival, fresh from special training in the Soviet homeland. Finally, the attacks against airfields would give NATO air parity, at least for the moment. The NATO air forces had fulfilled their most crucial mission. The much-feared Soviet ground superiority was decisively reduced. The land battle for Western Europe would now be fought on nearly even terms.